So this is the modal model of memory. Atkinson and Schifrin described this in the 60s. And it's called the modal model because it basically was kind of uh, common elements across many different uh, individual models that people had been developing in this early phase of the cognitive revolution. One of the main things that people started thinking about was, you know, how does memory work and let's organize it and think about it. And so this is really kind of the consensus view of how memory can be described again, phenomenologically. So the basic idea is you have some sensory input that comes in, and then first you have some kind of early sensory memory. The specific examples of these include iconic memory uh, in the visual cortex and echoic memory in the auditory cortex. From our neuroscience-based perspective, this corresponds to activity in sensory processing areas. So iconic memory is activity in visual cortex uh, where you have neurons that have been excited by sensory input coming in from the eyes. And those neurons will continue to fire for some period of time, about a second or so. During that time when they're still firing, you can kind of access that information, that, that pattern of neural firing, and, and sort of recover what it is that you saw, um, even if it was flashed briefly. And so this is kind of what this iconic memory uh, corresponds to is that trace of activity of neurons in the visual system, and it does extend up, you know, into the temporal lobe, these higher levels a little bit, but mainly back there in the in the occipital cortex um, is the primary source of this kind of iconic memory. And likewise, echoic memory is in auditory cortex, etc. So this is this is really simple, and from a neuroscience perspective, again, it's just you know neurons firing. Uh, in, in response to sensory input. We have down here this kind of decay pathway, uh, which is where, inf where memory is lost, okay? So memory comes in, this kind of sensory input provides the source, and then this is kind of the sink, the route that information uh, leaves memory. If you don't attend to information in sensory memory, then those neurons, you know, which were firing, stop firing, and you, you kind of lose whatever it is that they were encoding. So attention then is the gateway from sensory memory into short-term memory. And short-term memory is just from a neural perspective, the firing of neurons at a higher level in your brain. And we've, we've shown this kind of hierarchy of processing areas over and over again. And so once you get that activity up into the higher levels of that hierarchy, reflected as these kind of higher levels in the temporal lobe, for example, also higher levels in the parietal lobe, also in frontal cortex, that activity in these higher level parts of the brain is what corresponds to short-term memory. And this is smaller capacity, and that's because these are all brain areas that are kind of talking to each other. This is really the contents of your conscious state. And when we think about you know, our description of consciousness, this bi-directional recurrent connectivity among all these areas in the higher levels of that cortical hierarchy, that's what we're talking about here. These neurons talking to each other in a bi-directional way between frontal cortex, uh, temporal lobe, active firing of those neurons is short-term memory. That's much more capacity limited, okay, because one of the features of consciousness that we talked about is that um, it has that unity, unitary characteristic, so we tend to focus on one or a few, a small handful of things at any given time. We can't sort of hold on to and coordinate neural firing across all those different brain areas, a large number of items in parallel. Sensory uh, processing areas can sort of have low-level signals about, like, you know, the entire visual scene that you're seeing, but you're only attending to a small subset of that. And that's really what becomes the focus of your conscious awareness. This short-term memory is actually more long-lasting because there's more bi-directional excitatory connections there that are supporting the maintenance of those neural signals firing over time. The neurons can continue to fire roughly maybe 20 seconds or so in short-term memory. It's not a really a fixed number because you can also kind of rehearse this information. You can kind of explicitly recycle uh, the activity in a more deliberative, conscious way um, 
to try to maintain that information in short-term memory. And so that can kind of produce uh, more long-lasting activation, basically until you get distracted. And the capacity of this short-term memory is roughly three to four items. And again, you can go across all different domains and amazingly, it's always the same number, about three to four. There was a, a very famous paper by uh, Miller that's argued that it was, you know, seven plus or minus two was the capacity of memory. Uh, but in fact, that's only for verbal information that you can kind of verbally repeat. Now, it's true that we use this verbal kind of what we call the phonological loop to, to store and rehearse information in this kind of active form, kind of saying it to ourselves over and over again, that is a very important form of short-term memory. And that does have a capacity that's slightly larger, more on the order of, of around five to seven items. Uh, but most of everything else, like if you look at just a random number of items in a display, a number of cones, just any kind of random sensory signal or something, it's about three to four items. And if you don't rehearse information in short-term memory, then you lose it. Uh, and so this kind of uh, decay uh, loss pathway is uh, for unrehearsed information. So these two systems are just neural activity, okay, in different parts of the brain. That's very simple. Then you have this encoding uh, into long-term memory. It maps on to this hard disk kind of idea and it's synaptic changes. And the key thing is that the hippocampus has this very specialized ability to make rapid, relatively rapid synaptic changes, sort of relatively large synaptic changes that can quickly encode new information. Uh, and that's what makes the hippocampus so important for this immediate encoding of information that you happen to have in short-term memory can be encoded then and, and held on to with the synaptic changes in the hippocampus. Um, and then uh, you also, even when you're doing this initial encoding in the hippocampus, you're also changing synapses everywhere in the brain at all times. So anytime you have neural activity, as we saw in the learning chapter, that neural activity is what drives changes in, synaptic, in synapses. So synapses are constantly changing throughout your brain. Okay, they're never not changing, <laughs> but uh, those changes are relatively slow in most brain areas and only in the hippocampus are they fast enough to really capture kind of the, the immediate contents of what you were just thinking about and uh, enable that to be consciously retrieved. And so this uh, system here encoding into long-term memory mostly reflects the contributions of the hippocampus, but it also is taking place in other brain areas. And we'll see that, that you actually can have uh, sort of uh, changes, relatively fast changes in the temporal lobe areas surrounding the hippocampus. Those are sufficient to support a kind of recognition memory. Uh, you can sort of recognize something as being familiar. Those are reflecting changes in those synapses, even outside of the hippocampus. If we think about the capacity of long-term memory, uh, relative to this very limited capacity of short-term memory of just three or four items, uh, long-term memory is essentially unlimited, okay? You, as you get older, you start to feel those limitations in terms of, you know, forgetting everybody's names and forgetting all sorts of uh, facts and, and, and events and things like that. So memory uh, doesn't seem so perfect, but in, in a sense, it's hard to say you know, that you have a hard limit there. So there's lots of opportunity for interference. And that is really the main way that we lose information from long-term memory is this kind of interference process that we tend to overwrite prior memories with new information. And in that process of overwriting, changing the synapses from what they were before to this new pattern of synapses, the new pattern of synapses may kind of essentially lose track of what you had encoded previously. And that really is the kind of main capacity limitation of long-term memory. But if you work really hard to avoid that interference, uh, then you can kind of keep encoding new information without having so much interference. So this modal model gives us a phenomenological kind of intuitively appealing uh, account of how 
memory is organized. And again, we can map this directly onto these underlying neural mechanisms of active, active firing of neurons in different parts of the brain. So active firing of neurons in the occipital area is this iconic sensory memory. Short-term memory is active firing of neurons in these higher levels of cortex. There's actually a, a more robust form of short-term memory called working memory that uh, involves the contribution of frontal cortex. People, some, some people distinguish short-term versus working memory. Other people just kind of lump it all together. We'll talk about that a little bit later. And then this kind of long-term memory is really everywhere, but specifically in the hippocampus encoding these episodic memories. That's differentially important. So that's our big picture story of how memory is organized.